First from Matthew 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. From John 11, verses 32 through 36. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how he loved him. And from Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and their God, and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The word of the Lord. Oh, I'm getting better at this, taking a mask off and keeping the... Oops, I guess I didn't. The piece came off. There. Good morning, dear ones, both virtually and here in the congregation. We'll see how that stays on. There. So, for those of you who don't know me, my friends call me Sandy. I've been coming to this church for, I guess, 20 years, on and off, sometimes more off than on. Um, But I keep coming back because this is a wonderful community of faith. Uh, For those of you whom I have not yet met, uh, our dear pastor, who's quarantining right now, uh, had invited me uh, several weeks ago to be today's speaker and to talk about grief and comfort, and I added hope, grief, comfort, and hope, uh, because of my uh, former work experiences before I retired last year. In my 20s and 30s, I was a registered nurse, a lot of high-risk ICU, emergency room, burn units, trauma centers, uh, more trips to the morgue than I care to count. I had a call to ministry in my 30s uh, to be a military chaplain. And uh, again, uh, being deployed, being on active duty for a time as a Navy chaplain, I did more burials at sea Uh, than I care to count, too many to count. And this was, for those of you who are younger than me, uh, this was in the time in history before cell phones, emails, uh, the ability to text with instant news. So often some of those death notifications that I would have to uh, deliver in various oceans to ships, to sailors on ships without chaplains, uh, it was riding the helicopter from ship to ship and uh, comforting the sailors and doing our best to get them home as soon as possible. Um, And then when that season in life came to an end, uh, one day I was sitting at my kitchen table here in Kitsap County praying for a friend who was just going on a hospice service. And I said, well, Lord, what's next for me? And wouldn't you know it, the phone rang. And I answered it. It was before we had uh, caller ID. And it was a local hospice that said, we have an immediate vacancy. Would you please start this week with us? And so, so how do you say no to something like that? I didn't go looking for it, but it came looking for me. And then I was in privileged space for more than a dozen years. Uh, first, initially as an interim hospice chaplain, lots of uh, bedside moments with families losing loved ones. Uh, And then the last 11 years, uh, I was a bereavement counselor with one of our largest hospices uh, in the United States, providing grief care for hundreds, literally thousands of people over the years, plus doing grief events uh, for schools, for facilities in the early COVID days, 
uh, a few state conferences for dozens of hospices on various kinds of grief. Uh, so today, uh, Susie has asked me to talk about grief and comfort and hope, and I want to just say all of those multiple scriptures, Darren, uh, they really weren't my idea. They've come to me from people that I've consoled and counseled and comforted over the years. Those are just words that have comforted people um, since for thousands of years, all right? Um, and let me begin with a prayer. O oh God of all comfort, uh, you are our teacher, our guide, our comforter, our healer. Thank you for giving us this immense capacity to love deeply and for the immense possibilities of healing deep loss and sorrow throughout our lifetimes. Thank you for being close to the brokenhearted, for helping those crushed in spirit, for honoring our tears so precious to you that you save them throughout eternity. And now open our hearts to this message today. And wherever we are, whatever our loss is, whatever we're feeling, let this be a safe place, a safe community to be open and vulnerable to your healing work. Amen. So that's me. That's where we're going today. One of my favorite healing story, stories that I've used in grief groups throughout the years comes from a book called Kitchen Table Wisdom Stories That Heal by Rachel Naomi Remen. She tells the story of a little girl whose beloved kitten, Peaches, died. The little girl was inconsolable. And her parents told her, you really shouldn't cry. You can get another kitten. Peaches is in heaven. The child still remained inconsolable, and her wise grandmother took the little girl in her lap and held her and rocked her and comforted her, and the grandchild just sobbed into her shoulder. The grandmother did not try to fix the little girl or tell her how to act or, or how she should behave. She just held her. And if that is the only thing we hear today, just know that God, like that grandmother, is close to the brokenhearted, eager to comfort us, and that whatever our loss, whatever our grief, whatever our circumstances, that God is close to the brokenhearted. God is safe to cry with. And when we are crushed and overwhelmed, God is closer to us than our breathing, nearer to us than our hands and our feet, that there is no sorrow or multiple sorrows that is too immense for God's comfort. So, Years ago, I had a 12-year-old boy come up to me, and he said, Sandy, he says, I just learned something. I learned that everybody has an expiration date. <laughs> and it was like, oh my gosh, Sebastian, you're absolutely right. We have so many breaths and so many heartbeats. Most of us live to be pretty old, but not everybody gets that opportunity. That is our reality. There is a time and there is a season for all of us to be called home. Grief is something that will impact every single human being, all races, all orientations, all genders, all nationalities, everywhere in the world. We might show it differently, grieve it differently, have various kinds of rituals or words of comfort, but we are united in our common bond that sooner or later, grief will touch our hearts. And we grieve all kinds of things. We grieve, goodness gracious, we grieve the loss of pets and of toys and of opportunities. We grieve the loss of health and our independence. Uh, there are just so many things and that it's just impossible to list, but the most common grief that we usually identify with those emotions is the loss of loved ones. And for the next three weekends in a row, right? So we have three saints who were longtime members of this congregation. They represent more than a hundred years 
of combined faithful years of worship, of service, of love, of friendship, and we're going to miss them a lot. But even if you didn't know them, there are some things about grief that I think are really helpful that I've learned from people throughout the years. Grief is hard. Grief is hard, and grief is messy, and grief takes time, and grief refuses to be fast-forwarded. Grief will not heal with a Band-Aid or a platitude. Grief is part of God's work in us, that when we love deeply, we are going to have the big sadness, the big sorrow. But here is the hope in all of it. We will be comforted, and although our hearts break, and our hearts weep, the heart can heal. And with God's help and the people of faith in the church and in the community and some of the least likely human beings that we will get through it. We will survive. Winnie the Pooh reminds us that we are more resilient than we think, that we are stronger than we realize and smarter than we give ourselves uh, credit for. It is deeply personal, and no two of us are going to grieve in exactly the same way. And that is kind of the beauty of it all. You know, a common saying is that we do, do you, you do you. And so just with grief, as unique as our fingerprints, we need to honor our deep feelings, to find safe places and people to be with, to take our time, go through the process. We have to feel it, they say, in order to heal it. And for most people with big loss, big, big losses, it's not over in a day or a week or a month. It can take years of gradual healing from the depths of our spirit to the rest of our body. So isn't that good news to start the new year with? As a, sparing, uh, as a caring church community, we have some special superpowers for healing that secular communities do not have. We have each other, and we have an immense capacity to comfort and console others in grief while we ourselves are still grieving. We have the ability to pray and to care for people, even strangers that we've never met before. I remember one church community I was preaching at years ago in North Kitsap, I asked for any prayer requests during the service, and this gentleman in a pew tentatively raised his hand and he said, my, my brother died a few hours ago this morning. I, I really didn't know what to do. So I came here, and what a beautiful moment of the church in action. Somebody sat next to him. Another person brought him to coffee hour and helped him sit in a quiet place. People helped him make phone calls and start notifying next of kin. It was a tender, poignant moment. Everyday people caring for somebody whose heart was broken, who was still shell-shocked and reeling from his loss. Truly, God is close to the brokenhearted and uses people like us. My favorite verse in the Bible however, is the Matthew verse, when Jesus teaches early in his ministry the Beatitudes, and he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He didn't say, sometimes you'll be more uh, comforted, or this is only for a chosen few. He said, all of you will be comforted. We can take it to the bank. It is a guarantee from above. And he is a man, we're told, of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. And I have found throughout the years that Jesus is a very impressive grief teacher. When his cousin John the Baptist was horrifically beheaded, he went to a deserted place to be with his feelings. When his dear friend Lazarus died, even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he wept publicly. He mourned. Grief can be private and solitary. It can also be more public and communal. And that's what we'll be doing over the next three weekends with the memorials, where the bereaved come together to honor our sacred dead, to hear words of comfort and hope, 
to sing songs that will uplift our spirit, to share stories that will honor the legacies of these dear people with the comfort of Christ, with the wisdom and compassion of God. Now, one group of people who is often overlooked in grief are our little ones, our children. And this is something that I would encourage all of us to be sensitive to. When children are old enough to receive love, and that begins at infancy, they are old enough to need comfort during times of loss. Often the adults are so involved in the tragedies, in the end of life, that we forget that children are watching everything we say, everything we do, and this is all new for them. One little girl at a hospital room that I visited years ago, her parents were at a bedside while her grandfather was dying. She couldn't have been older than six. Her eyes were like saucers, and I sat next to her, and we colored, and then she asked for milk and cookies. And God's comfort, dear ones, can be as simple as coloring with a child, holding an infant, bringing milk and cookies to a little one. Another funeral I had gone to years ago was my grandfather, uh, who was in his 90s. One of his little, little great-grandchildren came to the service, walked up the aisle with her mommy for the casket for a viewing. And that's always a personal thing, isn't it, for parents, whether or not to have children there with them or not. But this particular child had her teddy bear, and she put her teddy bear in her great-grandfather's casket. She didn't understand death. She didn't understand what was really going on at that tender age, but she knew comfort was needed, and she loved her great-grandfather, and she wanted him to have something to bring with him to heaven. So when we have children at all these different ages, please remember to help them in their sorrow to model age-appropriate ways to grieve, to remember and include them if you think it's appropriate in, in the memorials and the services, to feel free to talk about the loss, uh, to understand that sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're mad, sometimes they're glad because they have to go play and release some pressure. Uh, but we need to help them again and again throughout their growth and development so that they can learn how to grieve in healthy, skillful ways so that when they grow up, they can open up their hearts to love deeply and to cope with their losses and then teach their children and their children's children. One of my favorite books, and I've shared this in an email to Deanna and Alex, is Tear Soup. It's in our public library, and, you know... If, if there's only one book I could recommend in the entire world for grief, it is Tear Soup. Whether we are young or old, part of grief, whatever the loss, is finding safe places to cry and to honor our losses. And Tear Soup is beautifully illustrated. It's gentle. It's all about a granny who lost somebody precious. And she is having her grandchild, very young child, visit her, and she's teaching the child how to take care of themselves during loss, when people are helpful, when people are not, how to be kind to yourself, how to be kind to others, how to honor your feelings, and how to not be afraid of death and not be afraid of loss. So let's finish now with hope. Hope is my favorite four-letter word. If I ever get a tattoo, I think that will be my tattoo. And I hope my dear wife isn't listening right now because we don't have tattoos. But hope is my favorite four-letter word in grief. Uh, when I was a bereavement counselor, people would ask if I believed in life after death, and I would go, yeah. I'm a bereavement counselor. I have seen some of the sparkle and joy in life come back to those who are bereaved. It takes time. It's not always pretty. It can be pretty messy. But people do survive and often come back to thrive. You know, it's kind of a God thing, I think. And then I've also been at so many deathbeds, but the one that has touched my life more than anything else was when I was with my mother 
When she died, years ago, back in the 80s, uh, she had been on hospice service. I looked at her in the facility. I knew this was the day she was going to die. We brought her home because she wanted to go home. And I will always remember her last words. She said, I am home, thank you. And then she said, God is calling my name, and I'm not afraid, and then she died. My beloved grandmother, uh, who was in her 90s, her mother was there, and we, her, my grandmother just began to weep, just like Jesus wept with Lazarus, and she burst into song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. And at that time, my grandfather was still alive, and she went upstairs to the bedroom where he was an invalid, and she held his hand, and she told him that their last child died. They had outlived all their children, and, to and together they wept, they cried, they prayed, they sang, but they were comforted. And so therefore, dear ones, we grieve with hope. Whatever our faith, however faint or however strong, God is with us. God gives us hope. Death is not the end. We are told in the good book that someday death will be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And I don't know about you, but I, I really hate death. So I'm looking forward to that day, the day where there'll be no more grieving, no more tears, no more mourning, no more death. So let us grieve as those with hope. Let us comfort one another with all of these words. So let's wrap this up with just a couple of quick practical applications. First of all, number one, someday God's going to call us by name to our heavenly homes. Don't be afraid. And for the bereaved, remember God is closer to you than your breathing, nearer to you than your hands and feet, that God will comfort you. And let Jesus be your grief teacher in solitude and in community. Number two, remember our children. Teach them how to grieve. Teach them how not to be afraid of death. Teach them that this is part of the life cycle and that the more we teach them and help them, the better equipped for life they will be. And then finally, we are the people of God. We are the church in all of our frailties and vulnerabilities and imperfections. Sinners, saints, I think I'm more of a sinner than a saint. Uh, we can provide solace and strength in ways that others might not be able to as effectively. Practical acts of kindness and thoughtfulness to those who are vulnerable and in deep sorrow, providing a safe place to come and mourn people's losses. It could be sharing a teddy bear with a child, knitting a prayer shawl, caring enough to write a condolence card, remembering to touch base with the bereaved months and even years after their loss, because sometimes, usually, we feel more and not less for those first few years. God will give you wisdom. God will give you strength. God will comfort you in your sorrow. And together, we are better together. So thank you. Thank you for having me today. And I want to close with this litany that Woody prepared a slide for. And I will read the first line, and then I'll invite you to join me in the litany uh, together. The words are, we remember them because we're supposed to remember them. We need to remember them. In the rising of the sun and its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of summer, we remember them in the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. And in the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick of heart, we remember them. And when we have joys and special celebrations we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are part of us, 
and we remember them. And that comes from a Jewish prayer book, if you're looking for where that came from. So, dear friends, let's pause for just a moment of silent reflection before we have our song of response. <laughs> 